Welcome to the Spinosocene period. The Spinosocene period comes after the Terranocene, lasting from 81 million years to 100 million years into Blant's history. The period is known for the development of large forests of cactuses descending from the Bataya, most notably in South Lyrusa. Salachopods also begin to claim more terrestrial niches around this time. The Spinosocene is most similar to the Carboniferous period of Earth, as both feature gigantic invertebrates and the proliferation of large forests, among others. This is how the continents have looked throughout the Spinosocene. Kanmapu and North Lyrusa continued to drift closer to each other and eventually collided, only separated by mountains. Sea levels began to drop around this time. With the merging Kanmapu and North Lyrusa, some Papalophines migrated to the once distant northern continent, diversifying in new and exotic ways. The engorged porcupine caterslug is one such product of this migration, having split off from more serpentine breeds and evolved into a generalistic omnivore. Its exoskeleton is adorned with venomous spikes to warn off predators, and its tissues are saturated with poison, making it very disgusting to the taste. Its purple coloration advertises its toxicity. The porcupine caterslug reached up to a foot in total body length and weighed up to 6 kilograms when fully grown. The young are about an inch when they first hatch and have significantly shorter spines than the adults, although they increase in length with each molt. Although salachopods were the dominant shark clade on land, basal salachopodiforms continue to evolve, with some, like Bufusquals and Satiabilis, filling the nations of amphibians like frogs and toads. The animal is so named to its generalistic feeding behavior, as it's swallowed up any animal smaller than its size. Beautiful squalls were now about turning cannibalism, as even smaller members of its own species were on the menu. Its mottled green skin blended in with the murky water. Beautiful squalls and satiabillas can grow between 6 to 9 inches in length, comparable to a cane toad. Unlike other shark species, the majority of this animal's length is taken up by the body rather than its reduced tail. However, its young initially have elongated tails for swimming, making them akin to tadpoles. Some types of salachopod form shark adapted more unorthodoxically to claim available niches. The gimbi, or relative to Bufus squalls, has developed an almost circular maw from the snapping jaws of its ancestors, ringed with serrated teeth that make short work of its prey's hard shells. This development in the creature's mouth design allowed it to coexist with its close relative by way of niche partitioning, where several competing species are driven to different niches by natural selection. The gimby was larger than its generalistic relative and about a foot in length on average. Although it rivaled the Kanmapu and Porcupine Caterslug in length, this Salachopodiform was lighter at only 2 kilograms. Its young were about half an inch long upon first hatching. But Salachopods became extremely successful and diverse following the Terrena scene, paving the way for some to specialize further for life on land. One group, the Eusalachopods, Developed a single claw in each foot to increase their grip on the rough terrain, and evolved to lay eggs of watertight shells, much like amniotes on Earth. The salachopods that remained amphibious still laid their eggs in the water and retained small gill slits, becoming known as the anonicopods. Anonicopods, while small and tied to the water, were still prolific in wetland ecosystems throughout the Lyrusas. The common squalamander was one such species, and a semi aquatic predator that fed on small arthropods along the shoreline. While squalamanders and other anonicopods are perfectly capable of walking on land, they can still swim efficiently due to their enlarged dorsal and caudal fins, which are either mostly vestigial or serve as sites of muscle attachment and use latopods. On squalamanders typically measure up to 6 inches in length, or about as long as an average salamander. However, exceptionally long-lived individuals have the potential to reach up to 8 inches. However, this still puts them on the smaller end of the salatopod length spectrum. The Spinosocene period is most well known for the development of a new biome referred to as the Bataya Forest. Populated mostly by descendants of the Bataya cactus, these dry forests dominated South Lyrusa throughout much of the period, although small patches also appeared in drier regions of North Lyrusa. Many of the local fauna are adapted for semi arid climates or depend on the cactuses for survival in one way or another. The cactuses that comprise the majority of the forest are referred to as Bataya trees. One such species was Validaris's Bataya tree, named to a friend, one of the more commonplace varieties with very little change from its ancestors, barring its tree-like appearance. The cactus grew within height ranges comparable to a maple tree on Earth, 
and was adorned with large thorns that deterred large animals from trying to bite into its trunk. Its fruit is nearly identical to the dragon fruit we know and cultivate, albeit bigger. Some salachopods adapted to the Bataille forms by becoming lip and lizard-like in shape for greater agility. Parcarosoroides gracilis was a speedy insectivore that preyed on orthopods smaller than itself. Still, it was a staple in the diets of many sized or large predators, such as spiders or razorwood moths. However, its speed and stamina gave it the edge over any orthopod that wanted to make a meal out of it, making surprise attacks the only viable way to successfully catch it. Size ranges for Carcharosoroides gracilis mirror those expressed by leopard geckos, with adults measuring between 7 and 10 inches in length. The pups of the salatopod measure around 3 or 4 inches from snout to tail, and elderly individuals may even grow past a foot. The first herbivorous salatopods evolved to take advantage of the abundant growth of Pattaya during the spinosis scene. Ruba Dracon Pattaya Fagus was a heavy set animal, with barely blunt teeth, perfect for shearing through the tough tissue of the cactuses it fed on. Although a plant eater, its teeth were still sharp enough for use in protecting itself from anything it saw as a threat. One of the largest land animals of the time, Fruga Dracon had very little fear as an adult. Fruga Dracon Bataiophagus grew up to a maximum body length of 6 feet on average, or about as long as some large breeds of pig. Although this would be eclipsed by larger animals in the future, the herbivore was still one of the larger land animals at the time. It weighed about 180 kilograms. Razor whip moths continue to be a mainstay among predators even with the changing climate. Atrocipapalon carnifex, the species that gave the moths their family name Atrocipapalonidae, is near the top of the food chain of the Pattaya forest and an ever-present threat to arthropods and small salatopods alike. Due to its agility in the air, the moth had no need to hide from its prey, and as such proudly displays a bright orange tint as, so to speak, an executioner's scrap. Atrocipapalon carnifex while large for razor moths and insects in general, was still relatively small and only 3 to 4 inches in length, or about the size of a domestic canary. Its caterpillars hashed about a tenth of an inch before growing to 3 quarters of an inch in their final instar. The cave fall lineage of the mucophobia team soon produced a new, more deadly kind of predatory spider. Onychobrachium vorax was notable for having freed up two of its clawed forelands for the use of grappling with prey. Although its ancestors were nearly blind, the spider had four functioning eyes to complement its already incredibly acute ability to detect vibrations. It bore enhanced reflexes that bore it on precognition, part of the typo, allowing it to seize agile prey such as razorwood moths like Atrasa Papillon. Onychobrachium forax grew quite large for spiders by having ancestors that were only as large as hamsters, maxing out at 30 inches long. This gigantic arthropod weighed about 72 grams. May have quite lightly built despite largely being an ambush predator. One group of animals to see some unique representatives during this time was the springtails. Although most were unremarkable to trinophores, one clade, the Myrmeca mimids, became used social and filled niches occupied by ants or termites on Earth. The red spring ant was one such species, having developed different castes dedicated to different tasks. Workers are non reproductive females that gather food for the colony while drones dispersed for an to be fertilized by the egg-laying queens of foreign nests. The red spring ant has a polyphenic caste system where different cats have unique appearances and varying sizes. Workers are usually the size of corn kernels, maxing out an inch in length. Drones are typically a few millimeters shorter, queens are triple the size of workers, and nymphs are only as big as grains of rice. The Myrmeca myrids, while abundant, provide a plentiful food source for highly specialized creatures. Nearly all salatopods have a pair of barbels on the snout that acts as sensory organs. However, the elongated barbels of Rostralingua armatus found a new use, poking into Myrmecomimin nests before trapping the springtails and dragging them to the mouth. The animal's denticles have evolved into a layer of protective armor to warn off attacks from predators like razorwood moths. Rostralingua armatus measured about 5 feet from snout to tail, excluding its barbels, making its body like comparable to that of a giant armadillo. Pups aren't as heavily armored as the adults, and were about half a foot long upon hatching from their eggs. As well as the Pattaya forest of South Lyrusa, one of the habitats that is most rich with life is the ocean, with many primarily or secondary aquatic animal species calling the water their home. 
Chief among these ocean-dwelling fauna are the new hemicillian sharks and several invertebrate clades, some of which had terrestrial ancestors. New hemicillian sharks are one of the most common animal groups in Squalosia's vast ocean. Species like Sardella minus and Dike, or if I'm pronouncing that wrong, were especially abundant due to their tendency to travel in large schools. Although an avid predator of zooplankton and small crustaceans, Sardella minus was a staple in the diet of many aquatic predators, as it lacked any defense besides numbers or simply swimming away. A large population of these sharks indicates that the ecosystem is healthy. Sardella minus undique is relatively small among sharks, only measuring up to 16 and a half inches, or about as long as an Atlantic mackerel, weighing about 2 kilograms in adult size. Its pups were exceedingly small as a consequence of becoming an increasingly explosive breeder, reaching up to an inch in length. While Nidarians largely remain the same throughout Spalooza's history, some descendants of the giant green anemone, known as arboranthenemies, or tree anemones, for their likeness to trees, took up a filter feeding lifestyle. Basal forms, like the verdant planemone, were small compared to more derived species, but still form small patches of primitive Nidarian forest that act as a home for many animal species. While its feeding arms lost their nematocysts, the planemone still has stinging tentacles for defense. Vertebral anemones are quite large for anemones, but as they are some of the more basal tree anemones to evolve, their average height is only 8 feet in height, or about as tall as a stalk of corn. However, long lived anemones have known to reach up to 30 feet. Arthropods and Spinocetine had as much of a heyday in the water as they did on land. The Greater Ocean Lily Pad, a descendant of the Terranocene Bristle Soul, was one of the largest. This marine spider changed its lifestyle from predator to plantivore, using its bristled pedipalps to filter microscopic organisms from the water and drag them to the mouth. It floated on the surface of the water, content to let the currents carry it wherever it needed to go. Its large size meant adults had very few predators. Greater Ocean lily pads were the largest, if not the largest, arthropods to appear in the Spinocetine period, bearing a leg span of 18 feet wide. Although not as constrained by the water, these spiders are still extraordinarily light, weighing only about 20 kilograms. The ocean lily pads were the only arthropods to take to the sea. Some razorbutt moths, like the Lassenvenator ornatus, took up a migratory lifestyle and hunted near the water's surface. Its spiked raptorial formlets have developed large hooks to secure slippery prey such as the sharks, which comprise much of its diet. This moth was one of the first to develop parental care, as its larvae were poorly adapted for swimming and thus unable to hunt on their own. The Lassavinator ornatus was one of the largest razorbutt moths to ever take to the air, boasting a wingspan of 5 feet at most, or a little bit larger than a red-tailed hawk. Its larvae were about a quarter of an inch long upon first hatching and grew up to 2 feet long in their final instar. While many invertebrates have secondarily adapted to marine life, the white cherubrank, a descendant of the slime wings, has done the exact opposite. While it still lives near the water, this sea slug has developed powered flight, being the first group of animals to do so post-colonization. It has also evolved to breathe outside of the water, using the lung derived from its gills to filter oxygen from the air. White cherubranks are a naturally leucistic species, meaning that they naturally have low amounts of pigmentation. White cherubranks, while huge compared to their distant blue dragon ancestors, were actually fairly small in size in spite of their majestic visage, with a wingspan of 18 inches, or about as large as a morning dove. They were also very light, weighing only a kilogram and a half. Aside from the proliferation of the lush Pattaya forests, little else has changed in terms of vegetation. Many of the tree species that have owned retain their basic design while experimenting with other, wilder roots of evolution. If anything, the crowning non-cactus development of plant diversity was the newfound success of kiwi populations in North Myrusa, where they formed much of the vines and wetland regions, providing food for the native herbivores and omnivores as they bore fruit. Although the arthropods were still a dominant fauna by the time the Spinocetine hit, Salatopods started to gain a foothold on land and started to claim niches wherever possible, being especially successful in wetland regions and the newly grown Pattaya forests. While the oceans changed to a far less drastic degree than terrestrial habitats, Aquatic ecosystems were still deeply affected by the evolution of secondary aquatic arthropods and flying nudibranchs, as they placed far more pressure on the denizens of a sea already teeming with competition 
to adapt to these changing times. Near the end of the Spinoza scene, a drop in global humanity caused the once abundant stretches of Pattaya trees to decline, heralding what will be known as the Snapian Extinction Event, a shout out to Professor Snape. As the Pattaya forest began to recede, the oxygen content of Skull would also begin to dip, rendering the environment unsustainable for many of the larger arthropods. His growth was a direct result of high oxygen levels. Aside from the Papalophytes, whose elongated bodies allowed them to more readily absorb oxygen from the air, many giant representatives of several arthropod clays began to go extinct, leaving their smaller relatives to survive. So Lachapon were infected as much due to their efficient breathing mechanisms, but many still had to adapt in response to habitat loss. Note that this video doesn't detail everything about the Spinoza scene, only the aspects and creatures most relevant to the plant's history. If you don't understand what I showed you all, you can always access the Google Doc or Sporecast for the project for more detailed information. The links are posted in the description. If you have any questions pertaining to the project, I will gladly answer them to the best of my ability in the comment section. On the next episode, we will move on to the Revolt scene period, where the Solatopods finally stake their claim on dry land and begin to dominate their environment. I'll see you all later.